ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. My name is Irene Stone, and I will be the moderator for the Santa Barbara City Council District 1 Candidate Forum this evening. The district generally covers the east side of Santa Barbara, from the ocean, up State Street to Canaverito, and along the Salinas Corridor. I welcome you on behalf of the League of Women Voters Education Fund. The League of Women Voters is nonpartisan and welcomes both women and men as members or as donors to our education activities. We neither support nor oppose political parties or candidates for office. We conduct these forums so you may have the opportunity to see and hear the candidates, ask some questions, and then make up your own minds. We are pleased to co-sponsor this forum with the Santa Barbara Public Library. We want to thank Transo Pro for translating the forum from English to Spanish and headphones are available. Also, Gary Atkins for the sound system. Uh, this forum will be live streamed by TBSB on Facebook at the League um, site. TBSB will videotape the forum and broadcast it on channels 17 and 71 as well as make it available on the local League of Women Voters YouTube site. Please see the link on our website at lwbsantabarbara.org. Candidates material is on the table in the back together with the League of Women Voters information. Everyone is welcome to join the League, scholarships are available, and also to make a tax deductible contribution to the LWBSB Education Fund, which finances the voter education activities. Please refrain from outbursts and displays, signs, t-shirts, etc., and hold your applause until the end of the forum. This will help us discuss more questions and maintain a neutral tone. Also, please turn off cell phones as a matter of courtesy. Unauthorized videos are not allowed. We would like to welcome the candidates for Santa Barbara City Council District 1 office. The candidates are in alphabetical order, Cruzito Herrera Cruz, Jason Dominguez, and Alejandra Gutierrez. Cards were passed out at the, door, um, at the door for your questions to be submitted to the candidates during the second part of the forum. If you need a card, signal to one of the volunteers <laughs> around the room. It is important that your card have a heading at the top that states your topic and each card should contain a question on a single subject. Be brief. The cards will be reviewed by a panel and questions will be grouped by subject. When your question is ready, hold it up for collection. So here's how the forum works. The candidates will make a brief opening statement, up to two minutes. I will ask as many questions as fit into our time available. Each candidate will respond up to one and a half minute response. The candidates then will answer as many questions as possible within the time limit. They will each have an opportunity for a closing statement. So let's get started. First, we will begin with opening statements. By lot, we will start with uh, Mr. Dominguez. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara for hosting this forum. I believe that civic engagement and voter education are incredibly important. The more people who register to vote and have a voice in our elections and politics, the better. On that note, I wanna thank everyone for coming tonight to the debate. I'm excited to talk about the issues that make matters and that matter to the residents of District 1. I'm very proud of what we've accomplished in the last four years working together. I grew up in a working class family in a small town that faced many of the same problems that Santa Barbara faces now. Housing, parking, homelessness, crime, environmental concerns, economic development. My dad was in the army in Korea. My mom was raising two boys and we lived with my grandparents. My parents took turns working and going to college while we were growing up. They graduated from Cal State Universities and so our household revolved around education. My mom ended up a teacher and taught elementary school for 30 years. I ended up following in her footsteps for a short while, teaching high school at a public school. My upbringing is a huge part of why I entered public service in the first place and why I've done it year after year for nearly 30 years. 
as a teacher, a nonprofit leader, and a government attorney. As a resident, I'm motivated every day to come to work and find effective solutions to the problems that our cities face. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Gutierrez. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alejandra Gutierrez. I was born and raised in Santa Barbara. I actually grew up in this district, just a block away from the library. I'm a local. I'm running because I'm a problem solver. I'm running because I've worked for the school district for the last 20 years. And my message that I've given out, looking, working with high school students and helping them go to college and helping parents become their own advocates and helping, helping them get connected with the resources in the community, my biggest goal uh, being a leader in the community has been to get people involved, to get their voices heard. Me running is to inspire youth and local, bring in more local representations to get more involved in politics, to create change in, in our community. I've worked at Franklin Elementary School for five years as the director of the Franklin Service Center, where we brought wraparound services to the school and thanks to those wraparound services that we brought to the school, but not only to the school, but the community at large, the test scores at Franklin Elementary School, which is a Title I school, um, improved drastically. They are now one of the elementaries with the highest test scores in Santa Barbara. Thank you. And Mr. Cruz. Thank you. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for organizing this, to the Franklin Eastside Library staff giving us the opportunity. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. My name is Francisco Herrera Cruz. I was born, raised in the community of Santa Barbara. I've gone to all the educational <coughs> institutions here. I was on the CIS Living Center for Youth Development Work. Yes, that's me. Can you say that word with me? Sorry. No worries. <laughs> Thank you, can you give me your name and address? Uh, yeah. microphone. No microphone? Okay. Yeah. Check one, check two, here we go. Buenas tardes, good afternoon, good tenabin, they would say. Kuali yowali in Nahuatl. So in different languages, we say good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for organizing this and for all the members of the Eastside Library. My name is Crucito Herrera Cruz. I was born in the city of Santa Barbara. I went to all the educational institutions here in our local community. I've stayed in my local community. I was part of the Golden Tornadoes and 89 CIF championship team for the Dons. Uh, we're turning around a couple decades now of a championship. Went to Santa Barbara City College. I was involved there with the Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aslan. It's Mecha. <coughs> Within the Mecha structure as student organizers at City College, it made us learn and be active. We did community beautifications, we did cleanups, we did mentoring programs with our community. There I transferred over to UCSB because I learned when I was a student trustee, when I was elected for the Santa Barbara City College, the aggregate macro, macro level of organizing an uh, institution made me realize that the only way we could make change is by getting involved. And that's what made me change political science major and Chicano, Chicano studies major at UCSB. Thus there, in political science degree and Chicano studies degree, it made me look at the symptoms, the issues that are affected our community and been involved with. When I graduated from UCSB in 99, I basically worked for about 20 years. I just recently published the book that started the social science of Chicano, Chicano studies. I've prepared income tax uh, for 14 years in this community. I started at H&R Block on Milpas and I have a good clientele base and I am pretty familiar with the economics of the community. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll start with really a general question about the role of a uh, city council member. And we will start with Ms. Gutierrez in this one. Uh, under the city charter, the city council acts for the whole city and has financial duties regarding city public funds. How will you balance serving and protecting the whole city while listening to and representing the people of the first district? I would definitely keep on respecting the priorities of the city. Uh, I think public safety is definitely important and we definitely 
need to also think about environment, uh, education. The libraries are very important as well. Um, respecting and re being able to represent the, the constituents in District 1 is keeping in mind when I make decisions on council about their needs, but also keeping in mind the larger issues and how it's going to affect the city, at, the largest city at, at large. But being able to compromise and working with other, the other council members on city council is very important. And Mr. Kutia, uh, Mr. Cruz. I think it's critical. It's uh, one of the tasks, responsibilities of any district member in focusing as a district one representative in district management plans and instilling sort of the infrastructure needs, housing needs, transportation needs, the educational needs, but in the gamut of community development of human services is critical and it's been forgotten uh, within the city. So the structure of what happens and is good for district one will also be reciprocal and good for all other six districts. So you have to be supportive of each district and look at their issues in a collective manner to make solutions because you need a, a four, three vote, a five, two vote, a seven, zero vote to get any legislation passed. So you definitely have to work with your colleagues on the dais to create solutions and the infrastructure needs of, uh, say, District 1. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Dominguez. The, the short answer is I'll, I'll do it the way I've been doing it the last four years, which is uh, not paying any mind to it. Just doing the right thing in any situation, allowing our uber competent staff, our particularly our frontline staff, to balance the needs of our city's residents. They look at the city as a whole, where are the problems, where are the infrastructure needs, and they tell council the order of priority. We would start with the streets with the biggest holes in the, in the, the biggest potholes and work there. It's not by district. Districts have been a great tool, not only here, but in other communities around the state, to take the power and give it back to the people, to take the power out of the hands of special interests. We've been ineffective as a nation in campaign finance reform, but district elections are great because you can walk your district and uh, balance out campaign spending. When I ran four years ago, it was the first time we had district elections in Santa Barbara, and the uh, voting turnout in my district went up 60%. We'd been averaging 1,200 voters the last three cycles, and because my campaign team, and many of them are here tonight, went with me door to door, we had an extra 800 people vote in that election. We got the number up to 2,000. And I was lucky to have 51% uh, of the vote. That was more than double what any of my opponents had with, with five people running. So I think district elections are great. And as long as we don't try to make a problem in the system, I think it's fine the way the charter has the balance with the, dist with the entire city. Thank you. Thank you, yes. And we'll go on to the next question, and we will start with Mr. Cruz. And the question about communicating. How will you communicate with your constituents? Will you have office hours? Do you communicate by Facebook, other websites? What processes will you use? I think it's multi-array. You have multiple w ways you can contact your constituents, your stakeholders, uh, property owners, voters, uh, non-voters. You'd have the gamut of the website, your city hall hours, um, definitely. Uh, it would be a job between eight to five and then five to about nine in the community. Email, face, libro, Facebook. Um, so you have multiple ways. Go to door to door, have your office hours available on the website. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Dominguez? Like my, uh, my friends up here, I live and work in the district. I first moved into the district in 98 and uh, live on the lower part of Milpas, work at 400 block of Milpas for my nonprofit job, and then I go over to City Hall, which is at uh, De La Guerra Plaza. So I kind of triangulate the entire district. So I walk it, bike it, drive it. And uh, so face-to-face -face time is the most important. And then being available by email, uh, by phone, by regular meetings, and I've really pr pr been proud of my ability to reach out to my residents, get them organized. We have a few community organizations that do a lot of work, including the Eastside Santa Barbara Society. Some of their members are here tonight. And um, there's really no trick to it. It's just being present, showing up whenever you can, 
uh, being encouraging of people getting involved. It's funny, I brought voter registration forms, but I forgot this is a League of Women Voters and they had a big stack out there. <laughs> One of my jobs before uh, I was on council was with California Rural Legal Assistance, which is a statewide farm workers advocacy group. And I was their environmental justice director. And one of the main roles was to get people trained to come to council meetings, to come to boards of supervisors and, and speak about their problems. And I worked mostly with people with lower education levels and who didn't have English skills. So it's, it's been easy to help my district to come out and, and speak up. Thank you. And Ms. Gutierrez. I think the, um, the number one job role for a district representative is to be out in the community and to be accessible. Uh, my experience working for the school districts, I've had um, positions that the district has had challenging um, getting the community involved and students and parents involved, but I've been successful because I think out of the box. I'm not somebody that just stands behind their desk or only has office hours. I'll be out in the community, it's exactly what I do now. Uh, I do hold a lot of the meetings office hours um, after five o'clock. I do agree, Facebook, you know, an internet website, that's very important as well, but just being out there and accessible and following through if you're gonna meet with somebody, you know, meet them where they can, where, where they're at. So the libraries, um, parks, local hangouts, but really have that flexibility to meet with your constituents because I think district, district representation is all about that contact with your constituents. Thank you, thank you. And uh, then going on to the next question and we start with Mr. Dominguez. Um, there are many uh, Spanish speaking uh, residents in your area. How will you ensure that people in the district whose main language is Spanish understand city government rules, information, and services? Luckily, I had the experience with California Rural Legal. Um, and before, when I was in college and law school, I worked as a community organizer in LA with a largely Spanish-speaking community. I, uh, during law school, I didn't feel my Spanish skills were as high as I'd like them, so I went to Mexico City and studied for a semester at UNAM. This was during NAFTA, so it was also interesting to be there to see how Mexico was adopting labor laws and environmental laws and how that imp impacted NAFTA. So it's, it's, like I mentioned in the previous answer, just being in the neighborhood, doing the nonprofit work. When I was at Legal Aid Foundation, a lot of the clients were Spanish speakers from the east side, so I have a pretty strong network. Uh, my family, on my father's side, is from Jalisco, Mexico, so culturally, um, I understand the community here very well, and it's easy to walk up to anyone's house, knock on the door, and feel welcome, and welcome them into City Hall in return. Thank you. Ms. Gutierrez. I grew up, my parents are both from Mexico. I grew up uh, learning Spanish in the household, so I'm bilingual by culture. I've spent the last 20 years working with the Latino po population here in Santa Barbara, especially with the immigrant population. I'm very familiar with my district. Again, I was born and raised here. I, I understand culturally some of their um, obstacles and barriers that they have. Uh, my biggest priority is yes, to get the information to them and it's not just by sending a, 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 you know, a newsletter but really going out to the community and holding meetings in Spanish and having translation in English. But really reaching out to that population. Uh, I've, been, I've had a lot of success working at the high school, bringing in the Spanish speaking population into the parent meetings at Franklin School. Our meetings are full and most of the, the parents there are Spanish speaking. Uh, I can communicate very well in Spanish, so for me, the outreach is very important once we're in city council because I think educating the public is very important to get them involved. Thank you, and Mr. Cruz. Thank you, I think that's critical be it that the second majority language in District 1 is Spanish. Um, vamos a decir que el, en Distrito 1, la mayoría de el, el idioma es el español. ¿Cómo le vamos a dar el servicio a la comunidad 
a los votantes, le vamos a hablar en español, le vamos a decirle las reglas, las ordenancias que hay en la ciudad de Santa Bárbara. I'm saying we have to inform them of the services that we have and the ordinances in a very uh, pragmatic way to teach them and educate them. The census 2020 is critical for our whole city, for state and federal services. And if we can't communicate with our community, for the census in 2020, well, we're going to lose a lot of uh, resources in the future and a disconnect. Tenemos que tener una conexión con la comunidad porque el census de 2020 va a implementar los números que se necesita para más recursos del estado, del federal, y es muy importante las personas que están escuchando. So being bilingual is critical, but also being tricultural and understanding our indigenous community, our ecological community here in our community, so we have to be transparent and we have to be communicative and eclectic because District 1 is the most eclectic district in Santa Barbara. It's the most multicultural, so, sí. Thank you. Sí puede hablar. Uh, thank you. Yes, gracias. Yes. <laughs> de nada, de nada. <laughs> our, our next question, we will start with Ms. Gutierrez. Um, what do you see as the main concerns of the residents of the first district and what will you do to address them? The main concern for our constituents in district one? Yes, that you see. I would definitely, uh, the housing issue and homeless issue is, uh, is very critical. And, um, and there are issues that we have across the state. Housing, safer housing, there's a lot of apartments and houses that are very run down and we have a large immigrant population and a lot of the people that live in district one uh, hold multiple jobs a lot of people say that people in district one are not very involved in their community but they are but they also have other priorities they're constantly in this survivor mode a lot of people won't speak up to their landlords to fix the pipes or the carpet or the windows because they're afraid to get evicted or the rents will go high um, homeless issue is huge in District 1. We have, uh, you know, PATH is such a great organization and it's, it's targeting this problem, but a lot of homeowners and community members do complain that the, the homelesses will go into their properties and there, there needs to be a lot more communication. And there is a lot of young folks that are couch surfing there are, that are also homeless. I work with a lot of families, single mothers, single parents, uh, fathers that are homeless, they're living out of their car in the safe parking. It's, it's a big issue. But housing, we need more um, inclusionary housing, workforce housing. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, oops, going to uh, Mr. Chris. Thank you for the question. I think that's critical. In the past elections that I participated in, and was in seven, nine, 11, 13, 15, and now this year. I have tenacity because the infrastructure in District 1 is always overlooked. We talk about infrastructure that has multi-layered up approaches to this. We talk about housing is critical, uh, availability and affordability. The housing rental uh, price in, in our community is skyrocketed. The land value is skyrocketed. How do we build affordable housing? We look at the state, county structure of the Regional Housing Need Allocation, RHNA. We work in conjunction as stakeholders with the Planning Commission and the Housing Authority of the City of Santa Barbara and the City Council and work to provide low-income housing because that tackles workforce housing, student housing, those that are escaping the tendencies of poverty. Uh, in our county, the average medium income is of about $30.71. In our district, it's not to that par. The infrastructure within our community, also within housing, but the infrastructure of streets, lands, lights are, are critical in our community. Thank you. And Mr. Dominguez, please. So uh, I've been the city council liaison to the housing authority, as well as to our tenant landlord task force. One of the things I first discovered when I was elected was that our general plan wasn't really accomplishing the goal of workforce housing. We were building a lot of very expensive luxury units. And then at the lower workforce housing end, we were actually depleting our supply while at the same time increasing demand, which was just driving prices through the roof. We were literally removing 
uh, units that were below market rents. And so it took about four years, but I was able to push for a series of reforms and um, change the plan and bring in inclusionary housing. We almost got 15%, but we ended up with 10%, so I'm proud of that because 10% is still better than nothing. And other things we've been looking at is grants from different government agencies to help us with housing, um, employer-sponsored housing. Um, we're using, um, I'm missing the word here, communes where people can own the property and get a land grant from another association. So these are ideas I think we need to keep working on in terms of infrastructure. The east side's really benefited over the last four years with our parks, bridges, sidewalks down to Milpas. Um, we have brand new designs for Dwight Murphy and Ortega Park, new equipment at Cabrillo Ball Fields. We have a new Cabrillo Arts Pavilion that will be coming open hopefully next month. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, yes, it seems that housing is the major uh, first issue, so <coughs> perhaps we should talk about that a little bit more. So would you go a little bit more in depth? What is your approach to providing housing for all economic segments of the city? I mean, including the zoning, public housing, improved development review, inclusionary conditions, transit-friendly development. How can housing be made more affordable? And actually, we start with Mr. Cruz. Thank you. I think if we look at housing as a macro issue, we look at a Milpas Business Improvement District. From a macro legislative level, we look at mixed dwelling usage, commercial, residential, that is equitable and that is not big. For instance, the 7-Eleven Milpas. Uh, that has a lot of critiques, a lot of irregularities in the way it was a process. <coughs> Changing the process of the bureaucracy within the planning department is critical. Some of the laws and ordinances are antiquated and need to be revised or at least deleted to make the efficiency of the ministerial process more efficient. It's critical. There's a lot of bureaucracy and there's a lot of people. It's a 100K club plus. A lot of administrators getting paid a lot of money that goes against services in our community. What we would do with the stakeholders with Housing Authority, provide a joint meeting with the Planning Commission where we would joint venture together. There's, for instance, a program in the Montecito Bank where it provides loans for low-income housings. You could have private investors, but you, since the community does not have it, there's a responsibility. The city has to establish uh, policy because most of the AUDs and inclusionary housing that has been is for moderate income and middle income individuals. That is good, but what is it forgetting is the lower bracket of the economic sector, and that's those that are almost homeless, low income, and very low income individuals. Thank you, and Mr. Dominguez. So some of the ideas I mentioned in the last answer, what I'd add to that is downtown housing. That's an area that I think most people agree, and I've, I've pushed for this a few times at council, and it seems like the trend or the interest in that is growing, so hopefully we're close to putting some more units downtown, and that's important because that's an area where people can live and work and not have to get into their cars. One of the problems we've seen, if you live on the east side, is when you add housing, it creates parking demands, traffic demands, and we don't have more infrastructure to fill those needs. We're not gonna build more parking lots. No one wants to do that. Um, we're gonna be having a, a widened freeway which is gonna put more traffic onto our streets faster, and we need to figure out how to deal with that. What I propose in terms of dealing with some of the housing problems is to help raise the wages and salaries of our residents. I'd like to see Santa Barbara and the region increase our education industry. I know there's a few people here from the education world because that's, it's, it's a twofold victory. One, there are higher salaries for the employees in education and students when they graduate from these institutions have higher salaries. And I'm, I'm proud to teach in an opportunity school, the Santa Barbara and Ventura Colleges of Law. And before that, I taught at Texas Southern University. And these are great ways to increase the economy of a city or region without necessarily causing any, any environmental problems. Another thing I'd like to do is work on financial literacy, do things to help renters get a, on a path to home ownership. Thank you, thank you. And, and Ms. Guti Gutierrez. I do have to agree with Jason Dominguez with the, uh, providing more downtown housing. Uh, Parking issue is a huge issue here on, on District 1 and also on the west side, and using those 
parking lots that the downtown area has at night that um, they're empty, we could use it for um, people that live on the downtown area and there's a lot of services like Mr. Dominguez mentioned, but also um, the housing authority has done a really good job providing a low uh, housing for low incomes, but we also have to work with develops, developers to include more inclusionary housing, but also providing housing for the workforce. Uh, I think the disasters that happened last year with the Metislives, we had a, a lot of first responders that we needed it to bus in, fly in, or even by boat. Because a lot of lawyers, a lot of doctors, a lot of um, police officers, firemen, uh, nurses, I know for a fact that the cottage was going crazy because I have family members that work at cottage that they were literally busing in and flying in first responders. And that's cr critical for our city. We can't afford having another natural disaster and having this population living outside of the city. If they're working here, they should be able to live here. Thank you. Uh, let's look at another issue also that has to do with the, in the east side, and that is Milpa Street. What is your vision for the development of Mission Street, I mean Milpa Street, I'm sorry, and we start with Mr. Dominguez. We had a... Uh community workshop here Tuesday night. It was great. There were several tables filled with people with maps of the Milpas area, putting down ideas, needs, solutions. And it's great just the process of the community coming together and talking about these ideas. One of the interesting ideas I heard was putting roundabouts along Milpas because that helps with congestion, uh, removes some of the traffic signals, which some of us find objectionable creates kind of a village feel for Milpas, and we all wanna see Milpas remain kind of a locals area. So that's part of, of my vision. I'd like to see wider sidewalks. I'd like to see some uh, newer, different trees along Milpas. There are some issues with the roots with some of our current trees. And I'd really like to focus on people walking and biking on Milpas. We're putting in a, a bike boulevard on Alisos, which will allow students to get to and from school easier. Unfortunately, only about five to 10% of students bike or walk to school. When I was growing up a few years ago, it was about 50%, but it's <laughs> unfortunately a lot lower. So we, we'd love to make Milpas a, a safer pedestrian and, and bike thoroughfare and really focus on supporting our small businesses, which means the city needs to do a better job of getting them through the system faster. When they're applying for a permit, when they need to do upgrades, even if it's just fix a roof, some kind, sometimes it can be really horrific in terms of how long it takes and how much it costs to get them through the system. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Gutierrez. For the Milpas area, I grew up on the, in District 1. Milpas really needs to get their clean, clean streets. Sidewalks need to be fixed. And I've been walking down Milpas and the neighborhood, and the number one thing that the local business owners will say is that we need cleaner streets and we need better sidewalks. That will help them attract more customers. They also mentioned about permitting process. The permitting process from the city takes a long time, and it's, a, it's expensive. So just how easy the city is easy to collect those fees, we should, the city also should be more I mean, more responsive in pr providing those permanents a lot faster. Uh, the city has this reputation of not being so friendly with people that want to bring in businesses. So we need to work together. People want to invest in our town, and we should allow them. Milpas is very dear to my heart because in Milpas, growing up, you had a, lo a lot of locals that owned businesses on Milpas. And we need to protect the, those local business owners and we need to educate them to be able to strive on Milpas. There's a lot of new business coming in and they should be able to compete just like the new business, the new, you know, the techs, the brewing companies that are, you know, very close to Milpas on Haley. Uh, the rents are, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Cruz. It's critical. I think uh, Milpas Corridor is the next economic engine of the city of Santa Barbara. It's always been overlooked and it's been marginalized. The economic development efforts critical to economic vitality of the Milpas Corridor is essential. Um, in providing an economic vitality working group like this past week, I was gauging it from afar. 
is critical. How, how do you fund something like that? Well, you create a business improvement district, a MBID. Um, that, in the essence, will create more civic pride, increase civic pride. It create ec more economic development. It would increase tax revenues for the city. How do we go about it? Well, we could go through uh, referendum, but we also could do that through procedurally through the dais, um, not make it through a state law, but a procedural ordinances where you would basically consider use of home rule, the home rule, because we're a charter city that provides levy assessments to property owners or uh, the businesses that are in the district. Um, why? Legally, under the Home Rule Authority to level assessments, you could do this under a procedural uh, legislation of the dais, and it wouldn't have to be uh, an election or a ballot measure. Thank you. Well, another major issue that came up was homelessness. So let's uh, have a question on that. How do you view the issue of homelessness in Santa Barbara as primarily an issue of law enforcement, social services, health and behavioral wellness services, housing supply, or a combination? And what would your priorities be in addressing the issue? And we start with uh, Ms. Gutierrez. Homeless issue is just not um, an, issue, an issue for you know, law enforcement or mental health. It's, it's, a com it's a combination. It's the city's responsibility to work with the agencies that are already doing a great job working with the homeless. We need to be out and meet them at where they're at. So we need to be out there in the streets and we need to work with law enforcement, with mental health, with, um, with the nonprofits that are already working with the homeless issues, but also working as a team and going out there and building the trust and looking at the homeless case by case because we can't generalize. Again, we have those homelesses, homeless people that are dealing with addiction, but we also have families that are out there sleeping in their cars. We have students, and not just college students, but actually high school students that are going from one house to another. And we need to work together. I know law enforcement gets a lot of um, heat that they're not doing enough, but just arresting or putting people in jail or you know taking them to the hospital is not gonna cover it. And yes, we need to provide housing for these people. Thank you. And Mr. Cruz. It's critical because it lands within the community development department bracket of uh, social services within the Parks and Recs department. It's critical because the funding uh, for homelessness or homeless activities or services within the city has always maintained, as I've always studied the city's budgets, at 1.5, 1.6 million. If you want to give more services and provide more tools to the people that are doing social services with people that are not fortunate to have a roof under their head, you give them more money and more investment to provide more services. Uh, when I graduated from UCSB in 99, I worked in social service uh, programs that empowered our community, that I used what I learned at UCSB, my bilingualism, bicultural, and my connections in the community to reconnect and empower people uh, within uh, community Action Commission, Family Service Agency, uh, La Casa La Raza for that matter. Um, so in, in those aspects, we'd have to increment the human services and the homeless. Again, we're talking about infrastructure. Lately, within the regional housing net allocation within Santa Barbara, they've been building <coughs> inclusionary housing. They've forgotten about the lower, lower income, those that are almost homeless, uh, housing within the city, which creates a crux, which creates a big crux with implementing housing that addresses those issues in our district. You're gonna have what we had a couple days ago right across the parking lot. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dominguez. Like some of your other questions tonight, when you said this, this, or this, the answer is yes, all of the above. We need more housing, we need more social services, we need more enforcement of the rules. There's no one magic solution, there's no easy solution. It's a bunch of small, hard to implement, expensive solutions that we have to be very dedicated to. One of the ideas I'm, I'm pushing and, and working with one of my colleagues on the council now on is, is a homelessness committee like the city of Oxnard has. 
where you bring experts in, you bring in city staff, and you keep coming up with solutions and you evaluate them, you pilot them. If they work, great, you double down, and if not, you eliminate them and move forward. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've worked with our landlord tenant uh, task force, with our housing authority. I'm excited that we received a HEAP grant, and um, I was a liaison to the community development department earlier, so all this experience my work before with Legal Aid Foundation, where part of our, our role was mortgage defense when the recession first hit, working to defend tenants, all of that really adds up. Uh, the city's embarked upon a path with one of the major landholders who's not always respected as tenants, and so there's some courtroom process now, and so we're cleaning up a lot of those units, which are, which are useful for our, our poorer tenants. So there's just a whole whole list of things we can do, but we have to just be vigilant and keep pushing forward and not miss any opportunities. Thank you. Uh, this next question is actually looking at another area of this, and this is a question of gentrification. Do you think that Santa Barbara and the East Side in particular is experiencing neighborhood gentrification that negatively affects residents and small businesses? And if so, what will you do to promote community harmony and vitality? We start with Mr. Cruz. Economic gentrification is happening in our community. Lately, under the general plan, what's happened, inclusionary housing focuses on the middle and above moderate income. It has forgotten about the lower income and lower bracket of our community, those that are most vulnerable. Economic gentrification as a model, we look at what's happening at uh, 219 East Haley. That proposal to take the cottages out, that's gonna make a market rate of about 2,500 to about $3,000 of rent for low income housing that's there for the cottages. So we're not investing as a policy things that are gonna uh, take us away from gentrification because the pricing and a lot of people from out of town are coming here because they love the uh, ambiance, they love the ecology, they love the four elements, the land, the air, the water. When we talk about cultural gentrification, that's happening also in our community um, where one community is not representative, it is not, their wishes are not taken into consideration. Um, that happens in our community and that necessarily has taken a change. Why? District-based elections has created now a plethora of brown folks that are Americans that are advocating for better communities and better districts. So it's happening and we're changing it. Thank you, and Mr. Dominguez. So many communities like ours were devastated with the loss of the redevelopment program when Governor Brown withdrew it to take some of these funds back to Sacramento. I was working in, in Modesto and Stanislaw County to try to help their unincorporated area bring back some of those funds because what redevelopment does is it allows you to capture increased tax revenue so when things do improve, when there is what some call gentrification, the city actually gets more revenue that they can spend to reinvest not only in the infrastructure but in housing. So that's been one of the biggest problems building housing since uh, redevelopment was taken away was the lack of those funds. There's a similar product called an infrastructure district where you can capture any tax increase. So if the city were to put millions into Milpas and it becomes more successful, more, more people shop here and sales tax goes up, more people live here, property tax goes up, we would capture that tax increment and we can reinvest it into the community, into housing, into helping small businesses survive, uh, absolutely, we should focus on harmonization, having people work together. We need to always focus on win-win situations. We shouldn't be negative and try to have one group benefit at the, at the loss of another group. So that's something that I'm really going to push for as Milpas moves forward. I think at this point, we're all more worried about a recession than anything. We've had almost 10 years economic growth. It's, I think, the longest period. It's been pretty weak economic growth, but still economic growth. So I'm much more worried that we have the opposite, that we have a problem where businesses and jobs are decreased. Thank you, and Ms. Gutierrez. I think definitely uh, gentrification is happening and it's happening in other larger cities as well, but I see it more um, that it's affecting our local businesses. 
And I think the city and the community as a whole, we really need to help educate these business, local business owners and help preserve, preserve those businesses and really help bring in more locals to invest in, in, in our community. I remember growing up, we had a big dog and we had Nexus and Carpinteria had shorties. And it was such a, I mean, we were very proud when we would you know, go to that store and buy a big dog shirt. And I think we need to, we need to come back and, and have that sense of pride. And change is, is happening, but we need to work as a community and respect um, each other's views and our, our needs as well. But I think we really need to focus, especially in the, in the, in the milkless areas, really helping our local businesses strive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, for our last question before the break, we're going to take, go to a totally different area. And this has to do with the climate crisis. What should the city be do regarding the climate crisis and its effects on our community? And we'll start with Mr. Dominguez. So again, this is an area where I think I have a lot of experience to, to help with the problem. I studied environmental law at the University of California at Berkeley, and then went to Germany and studied international environmental law in Heidelberg because they were more advanced than we were in how regions and countries can cooperate. So. I'm also serving on the sea level rise subcommittee with the city and we're looking at some strategies, how we adapt to uh, these conditions. One of the problems we have is, is transportation and, and gas powered vehicles, fossil fuels, we're not able to move out of them fast enough. Uh, I wrote a resolution that our council adopted that 85 other cities have picked up in California that pushed for more resources for alternative energies, really looking at jobs and alternative energies because they're high paying jobs. Santa Barbara with uh, Earth Day as one of our holidays that we founded, we should be the nexus of alternative energy. People should be coming to Santa Barbara to find out how we do things, how we develop solar, how we uh, implement them with, with our Spanish architecture, these niche products. And unfortunately, we haven't really figured out the key to get this innovation started. I'd look to UC Santa Barbara to, to play a big role in this, particularly for research with uh, climate change. I've actually uh, testified with the Coastal Commission a few months ago. I'm on the League of Cities Coastal Cities Issues Group, and several of us from around the state testified with the Coastal Commission on what we need to do. Thank you. Great. And uh, Mrs. Gutierrez. I think the Santa Barbara has done a really good job with um, bringing environmental issues and trying to attack them. Um, like Mr. Dominguez said, Earth Day is a huge signature for the city of Santa Barbara. Uh, I really liked how the city is has a goal for 2030 to be uh, to re be a city that has um, reusable energy, and really just educating the public and working together with all these the different agencies that are uh, representing the city at a state level. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Cruz. We would ha have to have a stakeholder meeting in the sense of creating an uh, eco ecology sustainability. For the climate crisis, what could affect us? Is the sea rising, an earthquake disaster, a mudslide, fires? But how do we create that within the urban planning development? The urban planning of development, what we have to consider is a new contractual agreement with Kachuma. Where are we going to get our water resources for 2020 and the extended contract that we need to look into? Water, the runoff water from the rain, having aqueducts, having basins within our city community that captures the runoff water. How do we reuse, how do we recycle, and how do we recreate? Well, within the city in urban development, housing is critical. How do we build affordable and equitable, but with a uh, ecological uh, perspective with this climate crisis methodology? What does it look like here in Santa Barbara? What does it feel like? So this is a new movement that's happening and someone from an indigenous perspective is in tune with the Mother Earth. And we have to protect the resources of Mother Earth from a macro level. That's what a public steward does, looks for the water, the air, the land, and the people. So we would need a, a plan, local plan for um, earthquake disaster, rising water, and how about no electricity? We go dark. 
Thank you. We now turn to the portion of the evening where we present audience questions to the candidates. Each candidate will have one and a half minutes to answer each of these questions. And we'll start with an immediate uh, hot boiler issue, I think, and that is the question of the Salvation Army wanting to purchase property and uh, build a housing on South Alisos. What is your view? And if you do not want it there, where do you think it should be built? Oh my goodness. And we are going to start with Ms. Gutierrez. The Alisos project is a perfect example of the lack of communication between our local governments and our community members. There was a meeting on Monday and we had a lot of community members that were upset. Uh, they were worried about the safety of their children, about their property value, um, but I, this project is ideal. Transition houses uh, for homeless have worked and I'm not gonna take any merit for, for the idea of this project, but we also need to take consideration of the community members, the neighbors that are actually gonna be dealing on a daily basis with um, the homeless that are gonna be there. And there is a lot of unclear answers but I think the city should have done a better job in the communication with the neighbors. They say that, you know, uh, Mr. Dominguez mentioned that this, is, this project is just in the beginnings, but when we had a meeting prior to the, to the Monday meeting, they had mentioned how this project was already going to the review board. So that doesn't mean it was on the beginning stages. That means this project was getting, you know, reviewed, there was already talks, and we need to bring in community members. So when a project like this comes into City Hall or to the council members as a district representative, it's your duty to actually walk the district in that neighborhood and actually see the real problems. Ideas are great, and I'm not taking merit at, off this idea. We have a serious homeless issue, and we need to target it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cruz. It's a very sensitive issue for all the people that are surrounding the location of where that development's going on Aliso Street. I'm against it. I'm against it for what I read in the articles in, that were printed. I'm against it for, it goes against the residential ambiance of that community. It could be re-looked at, redeveloped, looked into the central business district in the downtown corridor where there's less residential uh, units there. It's in its preliminary stages in its development, but there's already considerable, uh, a lot of people against it, and a lot of business owners that are against it. It would need further consideration in a different location. Yes. I agree 100% with Mr. Cruz, and I guess this is the first time I've agreed significantly with Ms. Ms. Gutierrez. This is the absolute wrong place to put this. You wouldn't need to walk a neighborhood that's an R2 to figure that out. Um, you know, we all need trash services, but we don't want to put a toxic waste dump in the middle of a family-oriented neighborhood. There's places for certain projects. The Salvation Army compared this to their Bell Oasis project. And when I pulled it up on Google, the Bell Oasis apartments were in the middle of a warehouse district on the opposite side of the LA River from the residential area. There was a huge buffer. And in that project, they had on-site personnel to help with the residents. Here, they're putting 14 of the most vulnerable residents, which means they have significant mental health disorders and illnesses and alcohol and drug addictions and other issues in the midst of a very dense family area. Some of our poorest residents, probably the poorest residents in Santa Barbara live there, which means they have the least ability to defend themselves against issues in their neighborhood. Um, issues have cropped up unrelated to housing like parking, uh, you know, where are these people going to park? They're putting in 10 units with only three parking spots. So my goal and my commitment that I made Monday night was to work with our community members. All of you have uh, shown a desire to help find a location that fits for this or work with the Salvation Army to tweak the plan so it doesn't bring in uh, a concept that scares neighbors. Thank you. The... Uh Next question has to do with the average unit size density. And the question is, what, what should the city do to implement the new laws regarding the processing of them? And uh, we will start with Mr. Cruz. 
Can you repeat the question again? Yes, this has to do with the average unit size density. How should this be in, implemented by the city? What do you, should we have three and four story buildings on Milpa Street? How should it be implemented? Again, architecturally speaking, you'd have to have the units that are comparable to the surrounding community. For instance, the 7-Eleven Milpas is not comparable. It is not harmonious architecturally or in the building structure for what's planned at 7-Eleven. It's a similar to what's happening on the Lisos. It's similar to what's happening on 219 East Haley Street. So in creating an AUD policy and implementing that in the future, sort of that has been the goal of the city council recently. You would basically make it equitable and distribute AUD projects throughout all six districts. Thank you. And Mr. Dominguez. Absolutely not. Four-story buildings are just not compatible on Milpas because it's mostly one-story buildings. There's a few two stories, but to have an entire block taken up with a four-story building just doesn't make any sense. The ABR rejected it, and this is a board of architects that the city council picks and we appoint to make architectural decisions. And unfortunately, it was overruled uh, by the mayor and uh, a few other council members. So land use and these decisions are so important. Another example of this is, is putting the police station on CODA. CODA is our connection to downtown for most east siders. We have this beautiful bike path. Well, you bike down the bike path heading toward downtown, and now we're going to have a four-story office building built from lot line to lot line, and that's the police station. That's not welcoming to residents who you're trying to connect to downtown. One of the things that most people have complained about is our downtown, and how do we resurrect it? Not by putting dead space between the east side residents and downtown. Symbolically and directly and practically, that's a bad choice. I wanted Milpas design guidelines, but this is another situation where uh, the mayor had a different idea, so we don't have them yet. But hopefully this, if we uh, push forward and we uh, have the right attitude, we can get that going. Um, so I'm also trying to push more uh, representation locally on our boards and commissions. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gutierrez. I strongly believe that when we ever, when we start talking about new development in the city, which is, you know, house, housing or you know, business, and even um, on the streets of, of the city. We actually, I think administrators and developers need to actually walk the streets and see what's actually doable because we could have really good ideas, but when we actually go to implement, it doesn't necessarily work. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is uh, about the funk zone, which is in your district. Um, what should the city do about the effects of the traffic, uh, parking, and uh, alcohol use uh, on the surrounding area? And uh, we're going to start with uh, Mr. Dominguez. So the funk zone is in our coastal zone, which means most of the land use policies come under our coastal plan, which the Coastal Commission has to approve. And we just submitted a plan to them, and it's, it's undergoing approval now. And the goal of the Coastal Commission is to keep that zone accessible to people from all walks of life, accessible for entertainment, for uh, nature, and uh, the ability to enjoy our beaches and open space, which is something I've, I'm committed to. Um, there's been an increase in commercial buildings there. And um, I think that's a good thing because it's, it's fought off some of the blight that the Funk Zone may have otherwise experienced. There are some areas there that are pretty... Uh, as the name implies, funky. But in the meantime, I think it's, it's, it's well utilized. It's enjoyed by locals and uh, tourists alike. We have to work on some of the parking issues, but we have a great parking lot on Garden. We just have to try to get users to try to start using that lot. Also, try to get people to use alternative transportation, Uber and Lyft, particularly if, if they are um, drinking alcohol. But so far, I think it's, it's, it's fit fine into our, our city's guidelines, and we just need to keep an eye on it. And uh, like I said earlier, work with the community development department so that businesses who do try to start there have a fair chance. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gutierrez. I think the Funk Zone is a really good example of what can be done in the downtown area. I think the Funk Zone has been um, a place where everybody is welcome. 
And not only do they have, you know, stores, but they have art galleries. You have youth, to college students to, you know, tourists that come and locals that actually feel a part of that area. And I think it's um, the Funk Zone is a really good example of some some of the ideas that we can implement on State Street. Uh, the Funk Zone has done a really good job with their this the business space, and we can start using some of the, those ideas, the multi multi-use of a space on the downtown area. Uh, if a problem arises where there's you know, ex excessive drinking that causes you know, people to get crazy or you know, crime goes up, I think as, as the city council, we see a problem we need to target and solve it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cruz. I think that's the new economic engine that revitalized Santa Barbara in some sense. There's a lot of people within our community, stakeholders and investors, that have contributed money to that location. And we've heard the funk zone for about 10 years now, churning, making money, tax revenue. So we have to look at the mitigating factors. We have to look at the whole infrastructure. It's antiquated. It's old school. It is when we could have uh, ran across the freeway from State Street across to the Chapala when they used to have lights on the freeway. I don't think uh, you might remember that, Jason, but uh, <laughs> you could look at the, uh, the infrastructure. Um, now that we have the economic vitality program within the city auspices, create a supervisor that is generated within District 1 and that reports to the District 1 representative to work with the stakeholders in that community. We talk about one of our largest industries, tourism. We'd have to consider a tourism entertainment tax to create revenue for the infrastructure to mitigate parking, mitigate lights, mitigate the sidewalks. Again, Coastal Commission is happening. There's a lot of regulations being next to the coast. We have to be privy to that and aware. Again, the investment is happening. And it seems like all the investment down to Funk Zone is going all the way down to Milpas. Eventually, in 20 years, all that's gonna be businesses. So we look at what's critical for the Funk Zone is infrastructure. Stop. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Next question is, has to do with the uh, infrastructure in this area, and what do you propose regarding maintenance of city's infrastructure, uh, city streets, parks, buildings, and uh, we start with Ms. Gutierrez. One of my ideas is when I make it to council is to actually do ride-alongs with police officers, with uh, parks rangers, and actually our, our city workers. I think the city workers, the people in general that are out in the streets and that are taking care of our, the infrastructure, the, the cleans of the park, the streets, we could, as a city council member, when you're out there and you actually see what goes on on a daily basis and how much time it takes to clean a park or what type of utilities they need, I think we can solve a lot of our problems. Thank you. Mr. Cruz. Infrastructure is critical. It's been overlooked within the city auspices. Um, we look at the uh, Measure C money that's funded through projects that is a 1% tax that is generated. That's going to equivalently make about $23 million. That's like RDA money. It's like for pet projects within the city. If you have pet projects, we have money. We have $23 million. There's where you get the idea we can fund this police department uh, for long-term operation costs. The infrastructure is critical because within the community development uh, auspices within the city budget, it has maintained the same funding throughout six two-year cycles. So it's maintained uh, like a tenth percentage points uh, with, with about what's equivalent to the city budgets for infrastructure. So if one was on the finance committee or the chair or a member, we would legislate more increments to the infrastructure that tackles housing, street capital, lights, urban development. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dominguez. So yes to infrastructure, and I'm, I'm proud to be the, the chair of the finance committee. And uh, this year we returned the city a $4 million surplus our revenues were $2 million above projections and our costs were $2 million below. 
And so that's not something that many cities in the region have been able to say. In fact, our neighbors to the south are really struggling with their budget. So we've been able to do that while at the same time putting millions more into our streets repairs. So you're starting to see a lot more of repaired streets, uh, new park equipment at Cabrillo uh, Ballpark. We're refurbishing the Cabrillo Arts Pavilion. In fact, that should open next month, so stay tuned. That's really exciting. That's a very, very old building that we're renovating. Uh, we've got a new master plan for Dwight Murphy Park and Ortega Park. Uh, new bridges here on the east side, three of them, uh, with ribbon cuttings in the last few years. So a lot of great infrastructure, and that's really, I think, the challenge for this council moving forward is, is maintaining that ability to keep these, uh, these expensive projects in shape. Uh, the desal plant, our sewage plant, these are all very expensive operations, but we've managed to, uh, to keep them going. So the infrastructure uh, investment project that I talked about for Milpas, I think that's a good way to keep our infrastructure here in the district um, elevated, is to do this type of uh, business improvement district and capture that increment. So that's something I hope we uh, get in front of the council soon. Thank you. Let me see, we do have a question here about what does environmental justice mean to you and how, well, how will you take practical steps to address this? And that goes to Mr. Cruz. What is environmental justice? Man, we can get a definition per the, each individual here differently. From a, environmental justice is when we come back and look at the resources of land, water, air, people, and we respect them with a humble dil diligence to respect Mother Earth and our own temples, our own people, uh, our own Santa Barbarans. So environmental justice is taking care of Mother Earth from an indigenous perspective. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Dominguez. <coughs> When I had the, the honor and privilege of guest lecturing on an environmental justice at the Bren School, I gave them the definition that it's environmental fairness, that justice is the same as fairness. How are you fair to people? And, and like Mr. Cruz said, fairness and justice, these can mean so many different things to people, but it's really allocating resources by being blind to people's economic situation, giving everyone the same access to environmental goods, by fighting pollution and making sure that you don't stick polluting uh, fa factories into areas that don't have the ability to fight back against it. We have a, a strong vulnerability index here on the east side because we have so many seniors and so many youth and they're susceptible to, to lung damage. And because of a large monolingual population, monolingual Spanish population, they have a harder time getting remedies to environmental harms. So this is something that we've really pushed as a city is how do we start looking more at this. We're lucky that we're blessed with a fairly good environment here in Santa Barbara, but there's always more we can do and we need to keep the environmental regulations high. Um, my background working with the farm workers has really helped me because I'm able to organize people to come to meetings and talk about how we deal with the environment, to go to the APCD and have people go there and talk about how permits are pulled or how we can fight a permit that shouldn't be issued. So that's how I'll continue to fight for environmental justice for our residents in, in the district and the city. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gutierrez. So when I hear environmental justice, I automatically think about um, preserving the areas where you know we have a lot of trees and greens and not develop like crazy. Um, so respecting Mother Earth. But I also think about the population that is more, more vulnerable. Here in District 1, we also, not only do we have, you know, the Funk Zone, the Milpas business, but we also have, um, there's an industrial part to it where there has been an increase in the district, especially um, with children in, at Franklin School with asthma. So there is pollution going on in District 1 that has not been talked about. And working with the Spanish-speaking community for the last 20 years, coming from that community, we also have to work with the most vulnerable in talking to them about environmental issues. Because again, um, the population, the working class population, the immigrant community here are not as educated about what's going on. 
but they, they come from countries where they really preserve their, um, their water and you know, the land where they, where they live because that's how they feed their families. Thank you. Let's see, we do have another. What is the answer to the city's unfunded pension liability? We start with Mr. Dominguez. The answer is to keep raising revenue and keep, uh, keep controls of the, the liabilities. Um, I had the, uh, I'm not sure if privilege is the right word, but growing up doing nine key entry for my dad who was in accounting school. So I had a, a small business, a printing company that I would enter all the, the numbers in for and do all the reconciliation. And the key is always have more assets than liabilities. Keep the revenues higher. You know, our, our big three revenues are property tax, sales tax, and hotel tax. And so we've worked at keeping those balanced and increasing. You know, the key to Santa Barbara for, for revenue and for quality of life is quality. Keeping uh, what Santa Barbara is famous for, the Spanish architecture, keeping our, our quality as, as a small town. This is what's gonna keep driving those revenue sources. The hotel tax is driven by tourists. They wanna come here to see that, not big, ugly, four-story buildings on Milpas. Uh, they're here, th they... Uh, We want them shopping on Milpas, which is why we want to keep it kind of a locals oriented. You know, uh, Super Rica has been bringing, you know, millions of people to town. There's always a line there. I hate it. I can never just go get a quick taco. It's, it's a 30 minute <laughs> thing. And then uh, property tax, you know, as, as people want to live here, the house, the house prices keep going up. And um, the only thing I do there is interface with the county to make sure that they're property, properly assessing those houses. So that's really the solution to the problem and also do what we can to work with our labor force. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Gutierrez. Could you repeat the question? Sorry, there was a side yes. conversation. Ooh, I, I just hear. lost it. What, what is the answer to the city's unfunded pension liability? <laughs> really just keeping the budget balance as the city has done a really good job um, keeping the budget balance and that's all I have to say to that question. Thank you. And Mr. Cruz. I've been studying this since I ran each election. That's like the, un, the elephant in the room that's never, 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 never talked about. Um, when you talk about employer retirement contributions, uh, you talk about funding services of liabilities for programs and perks in a continuum basis. That has to look, be looked at. They d barely discounted the rate from 75 to 7%. That was one aspect to basically having more employee contributions uh, or less contributions from the city to uh, the employees. When we look at the dollar value in 2025 for general workers, it's going to be 45 cents on a dollar. For the fire department, it's going to be 56 cents presently to 81 cents up each dollar. For the police department, it's going to be 55 cents to 73 cents in 2019. So for every dollar, our public safety is gonna get 81 cents on the dollar and 73. That's an anticipated present value at 33 and a half million dollars to in 2025, it's gonna go to $50.8 million. You're talking about an increment of about $17,000 million that could have gone to infrastructures, could have gone to regular general services, it could have gone to regular employees. It has to look at the full-time equivalent of their employees. There's about 1,036 employees, FTEs. That has to change drastically, and it has to change in a way that's um, sustainable. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, has to do with the traffic and circulation. What is the best way to protect pedestrians, cyclists, and safe routes to school for our children? while maintaining traffic flow and reducing congestion? And how will improvements you recommend be funded? And uh, we'll start with Ms. Gutierrez. Public transportation, definitely. Um, I think the city of Santa Barbara has done a really good job with um, providing, especially for SBCC students, uh, free uh, transportation. Also having clear marks on the, the streets I, th I think the bike, the bike path has always been a really good thing. Um, I don't think the city really has a big issue with, um, I do have to comment on Milpa's having the, 
the cross, the one that's on Quinientos and Milpas, the crosswalk there, and then the one on Ortega and Milpas, how those came up, you know, it, they were because of a tragic death. And I really think that we, there's a lot of parents I know that have complained that it's really hard to cross on Milpas during, you know, after school. But I think, again, it has to do with communication. They want more crosswalks, but I think Milpas has, according to the state, has an, enough crosswalks. Um, but just being, you know, clear with, you know, the lines on the streets and um, people respecting the crosswalks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cruz. I think it would be improving road maintenance, uh, program 4411. It's uh, one and a half million dollars. Uh, so the streets capital program, program 4491, budget page 515. You look at the revenues or what's invested, we need to invest more to uh, offset sort of the traffic congestions, um, build better infrastructure, better lighting, uh, road maintenance. <coughs> Those are pragmatic steps one could take. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dominguez? When I was with uh, California Rural Legal Assistance, one of the major grant programs that we helped our communities apply for was Safe Route to Schools, also called the ATP grant program. And it, it was money from Sacramento. More and more money is coming from Sacramento, partly because they're taking more and more city and county money, and they're doling it back out in the form of grants because they have oversight. So Santa Barbara, while I've been on council the last four years, has been very successful at getting grants to do transportation programs. And we've, we've really kept that in mind when we're hiring staff and coming up with our plans. Um, we've also pushed Sacramento to have some of that local control back. One of the problems here in this neighborhood is the speed limit going from Salinas down to Milpas. We can't drop it because Sacramento requires us to have it at that level. Um, I'm a big supporter of the Bike Boulevard. They had those in Berkeley, where I went to grad school, and they allow people to drive their bikes in lanes uh, where there's cars, but much, a much lower amount of car traffic. So we're gonna build these bike boulevards that will push cars out to Milpas, so you have concentrated cars there. Then you can have concentrated bikes on Alisos. And I was a big supporter of our bike master plan, which came through in my first year. I think it was uh, pretty early on, and it was a meeting that brought in a lot of people. There was some controversy over some of the plans, and we went close to midnight. But it's, it's been implemented, and we've got funding for big segments of it, like the Coda uh, bike lane. We're just adding more and more protected infrastructure, and I'd like to do more. I'd like to see where we push the cars away from the curb so bikes have that protected lane. Thank you. Another question um, that really someone isn't happy about. Um, they uh, asking about whether you support the idea of encouraging more higher income jobs to come into Santa Barbara, and if this is good for Santa Barbara to bring in higher income paying jobs. Is that a question? All right. Then we're going to start with Mr. Cruz. I think it's critical. I think part of the task when you have dormant uh, rental leases not happening on the Milpas corridor, talking with the stakeholders, talking with the landowners to see how much a lease to attract uh, new businesses, use a new marketing scheme for the Milpas corridor to implement. Like if there's tourism marketing for Santa Barbara, there's got to be tourism or community marketing for the Milpas corridor. Um, it, it is critical to attract higher paying jobs. Again, you have to look at the corporations. You have to look at business models within small business administration, within federal programs to get grants to help small business owners within the community establish their own uh, businesses in the community, which is critical because we want to have uh, small business administrators and uh, employers within our community that hires the new generation of millennials. It is a duality, this is a dichotomy. So yes, part of the responsibility is attracting new businesses to the community. Thank you. Mr. Dominguez. So when I came here to work for Santa Barbara County Council almost two decades ago, the boss who hired me is in the room, but I won't mention his name, he doesn't want the attention. Um, I didn't come here for the pay. I came here because he was a great boss. 
and the colleagues were great. I actually talked to a few of them before I took the job. There, I called, I used my alumni network and talked to them and they had great things to say about the office. It was very meaningful work and you felt like you were making a difference. So I look around the room and I know a lot of the careers that many of you are, are involved in and you do it because you love the work. And just like I do this job because I love the work, there's no amount of pay that would make up for that and we, we don't get paid very much, especially if you break it down on an hourly basis. What I wanna make sure is people get paid a fair amount for the work they are doing. Um, for people who are K through 12 or for our youth, I wanna make sure there's opportunities for them. Um, unfortunately, with the housing prices the way they are, it's harder for our youth to stick around. They have to stay with their parents um, or they share a room and they, they struggle to make ends meet. So let's create higher paying jobs for them if no one else. Thank you. Ms. Gutierrez. I think higher paying jobs are critical in the city, especially how rents are really high. High in housing is, um, is a problem. I think higher paying jobs will definitely help reduce the housing crisis that we have. Um, I don't know how Mr. Dominguez is going to solve this problem if he's, if he's also running for uh, an assembly. He's running two campaigns, but higher paying jobs are definitely very important in the city. Um, giving local graduates uh, an opportunity to, to find a job and being able to live here. Thank you. I think, yes, uh, the purpose of our forum is for you to present your views, for the audience to hear your views, not to have you discuss uh, your candidate, your opponents. Thank you. Next question. Is that political critique? Yeah, that's a critique, yes. Thank you. Rental housing, uh, what measures do you support recode enforcement for landlord-tenant mediation, just cause eviction, rent control, and I know there, uh, we have new state laws involved in this as well. But um, we'll start with Mr. Dominguez. So I, I spent a few years doing code enforcement in the city of Los Angeles, and so I was able to, that's where I first learned about housing tenant law, um, training people, um, worked with land, lords to improve their buildings for safety of the tenants and for public safety of the tenants. Um, did more of that work with California Rural Legal Assistance. A third of our work was, was housing law and helping tenants. And also with Legal Aid Foundation, like I mentioned earlier, we had a grant for mortgage defense. So as you mentioned, Sacramento just passed a whole slew of legislation. They've capped rent increases, I believe it was 5% plus COLA and that's retroactive, retroactive back to March, and they passed a just eviction ordinance as well. So cities and counties no longer have to do that. It's done for us at the state level, and um, Governor Newsom's really embarked on a plan to build more housing. I've heard him mention you know, 300,000 a year, so we'll, we'll see what he does with that. I hope whatever happens that the local government has the control to make sure that they're compatible with our local design and we allow our local design boards to make sure that these buildings come in at the level that the local residents want. We wanna have a high quality of life in our neighborhoods and only we can determine that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Gutierrez. I think the Just Cause Ordinance is, um, was, is very crucial in our community, being able to have that one year lease instead of the one, one um, month to month um, lease. It also gives the renters protection, but it also gives the homeowners um, a legal document that, um, you know, the communication between renters and, and landlords. Uh, the city of Santa Barbara has a really good uh, rental mediation program that provides also bilingual assistance, which is great. And their services are for free. So I think the city has done a really good job with providing those services. Change is happening. Um, rents are getting higher. You know, the values of, of the homes in Santa Barbara are, are high. Um, we also have to be considerate to the landlords and that have to pay their mortgages. Some, a lot of, especially in District 1, a lot of people have houses that they rent, but they've worked really hard to, to obtain those houses and they want to work with renters to, um, to be able to, to have a rent that is reasonable, but at the same time, not doubling up the rent, but where the landlord can also pay their, their mortgage fees. 
Mr. Cruz. Can you repeat the question, please, again? Yes, it was really about <laughs> rental housing and what measures do you support for re code reinforcement for mediation, uh, for just cause eviction, rent control, and we know the state has just passed uh, just cause. Uh, I think it's critical. I think that those have been prevailing issues for uh, the renting class, the renting people of Santa Barbara. Uh, it's critical to preserve their rights, landlord rights, but also rental rights. Because when we talk about Santa Barbara and the high cost of uh, renting and the high cost of housing, we have to look and create measures that consider rent control in Santa Barbara. You have Oscar Gutierrez who has considered rent control. You would need to consider two other council members on the dais to implement rent control to preserve people's economics, to have a little bit more to invest in the community, to buy, to be a consumer. Ordinances within the city of Santa Barbara are critical to preserve just cost evictions. Again, we have to look at what's happening. If it's not habitable, if it's not a dwelling that is habitable within the health and safety codes, we have to look at it where we preserve their rights and uh, provide a fund if they need a transition from one location to another because of dislocation uh, for habitable reasons. So it's critical that we preserve rent control stuff in that nature. Thank you. The last question uh, before we go to closing uh, statements is a little different. Uh, what message do you have for new voters? What is the best way to communicate with young people about the basic functions and responsibilities of local government? And we're going to start with uh, Ms. Gutierrez. When I'm out walking, and especially when I'm at the door, and I've encountered people that have not registered or have registered and never voted, the first thing I say is that in order for you to create change within your neighborhood and your community, you need to get involved. And the, way, the best way to get involved is to use your right to vote. You need to vote. Um, I, I, again, I work with a lot of families and youth, and some of the the issues that they have in their neighborhoods are city, it's, they're city issues. They're issues that only the city can fix. And the way that they can create that change, the first step is to register to vote and vote. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Cruz. Thank you for the question. If you look at the city's budget, that's program 1111. Mayor and city councils, can I respond to the needs and concerns of citizens? Yes. Establish legislative policies and approved programs. I could do that. Oversee city's finances. If I was on the finance department, finance committee, or on the dais, I believe I could do that with my income tax uh, experience and professionality. And service as, service as a liaison to the city's functions, to the different committees. Uh, I, I believe I could do that. Um, I would be a, an entrusted public steward to function at 100% 60 hour work week, even more. So that's a promise. Uh, Mr. Dominguez. So as I said, I showed up with my voter registration forms when I did community organizing in LA. One of the groups I worked with was the Southwest Voter Registration Project. And uh, your vote is your voice. It's a part of, part and parcel. It's the foundation of democracy. It's how you ensure that you have safe and attractive environs to live and work in. Um, it's how you get your elected elite leaders to create affordable housing and create high paying jobs is by voting in the people who you think can do that. It's how you protect neighborhoods from poorly designed developments. It's how you have beautiful open spaces and parks. I'm proud that in Dwight Murphy Park, we're gonna have the first access fully accessible park for kids in, in the county, the Gwendolyn Strong Park. And uh, they're fundraising now at nevergiveup.org so please take a look if you want to help Santa Barbara make history with this. Um, it's how you get people to maintain and rebuild important infrastructure is, is by voting. It's how you have open and transparent government is by voting. It's how you get your govern, govern, governing uh, electeds to be open and transparent and accessible is by voting. So that's what I tell people when they're debating whether to register or not, when they're worried about jury duty. <laughs> It's like all of these things, and they usually say, give me the form. 
Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, you now have uh, two minutes for a closing statement, and uh, we'll start with Mr. Cruz. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Muchas gracias por escuchando um, este foro de candidatos del Distrito 1. Yo me llamo Cruzito Herrera Cruz. Quisiera ser su representante para el Distrito 1 en estas elecciones por correo del 5 de noviembre del 2019. Good afternoon, thank you for listening to our discourse at our candidates forum. Thanks to the League of Women Voters, the Eastside Library, and those present to listen to our discourse. My name is Crucito Herrera Cruz. I would love to have your vote uh, to be your public representative and a public steward in the city of Santa Barbara. My goals are for the infrastructure development of our community, to increase the human services allotments to the different services that are generated in the city, and also to empower the youth with good educational programming and support services to our educational systems here, City College, UCSB, Antioch, Pacific uh, Institute. So in this sense, I appreciate it for listening, for giving me your ear and discerning what we had to say. And hopefully your decision could be made when the mail, vote by mail ballots arrive next week. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. God bless Santa Barbara. We'll save applause, please. Thank uh, you, thank you, Mr. Thank Dominguez, you. please. Thank you. I was elected to stand up for the residents of Santa Barbara. I am, not, I am beholden to the voters, not City Hall special interests or to local party higher ups. I bring an open-minded approach, a team-oriented approach, and a solutions-oriented approach to everything I do, and I think it's the sort of approach that works best in civil service. I'm always pushing for effective policies that support everyday residents, and I will continue to do that when re-elected to the council. I'm looking forward to advancing the many gains we have made as a city and to tackling the pervasive problems that exist in today's world. Please vote with experience. Please vote with a successful track record. Please vote for Jason Dominguez for City Council. Thank you, and we'll let's hold applause again, please. Uh, Ms. Gutierrez, please. Thank you everybody for being here. And um, I'm running for City Council because I wanna bring in more local representation. I was born in the city, I was raised here, I went through the public school system. I've been working in this district for the past 20 years. I'm a problem solver. I work with community members and organizations to solve problems. I'm willing to work with the city council, the other city council members and work as a team to uh, tackle the, the issues that we have. And three of my um, major concerns is safer housing and house, the housing crisis that we have, not only in the city, but in district one. Uh, to bridge the gap between our local governments and our youth and families. Stronger that communication between the city and the constituents in District 1 and the homeless issue. Thank you. Thank you, candidates, for joining us this evening. We appreciate your drive and commitment to serve our community. Thank you to the audience as well for joining us this evening. We hope that you found the program informative and useful as you prepare to vote. Um, I do want to thank the Eastside Public Library for co-sponsoring the forum with us. Uh, we want to thank the volunteers who made the evening possible. Also, SBTV for videotaping the forum. Transl Pro for Spanish translation and Gary Atkins with the sound system. There will also be a link to the forum on the local league website, www.lwvsantabarbara.org. Make sure you are registered to vote. Deadline for registering is October 21, and please vote. The city will mail ballots on October 7. The ballots will contain prepaid postage on the return envelope, or they may be returned to City Hall during office hours or to drop-off locations, including Franklin Neighborhood Center on Election Day, November 5th. Thank you, and good evening. Can we give a nice round of applause to our candidates? Thank you.